this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santopadre, and our guest this week is a celebrated film and TV director, producer, and editor, and one of the first names we wrote down when we decided to put together this podcast— his long list of credits include The Howling, Inner Space, Gremlins, The Burbs, Twilight Zone, the movie, and one of our favorites, Matinee. In his long career, he's worked with dozens of legendary performers, many of whom we love to talk about on this show, including Kevin McCarthy, John Carradine, and Christopher Lee, to name a few. His terrific website is called Trailers from Hell and features hundreds of commentaries on classic and not-so-classic movie trailers. Please welcome one of the few people walking the earth who is as obsessed with old horror and sci-fi films as I am. Joe Dante. Why, well, I'm humbled. <laughs> <laughs> We're humbled, Joe. Thanks for doing this. And and we've had on the show at least two people we think you're familiar with. Just a few days ago, we spoke to uh, Bruce Stern. I love Bruce. Bruce can tell you what Jesse Lasky had for breakfast. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> everybody, I noticed it, and everybody comments on on Bruce Stern's amazing memory. He seems to remember uh, things that happened before he was born, let alone <laughs> before he was in the movies. Yeah, he was uh, our, our first guest to ask us trivia questions. Well, he's 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 a fabulous guy. I mean, yeah. he's he's so much fun. To have on the set, I, I, on the on the Burbs, he was like the organizing uh, group. He he would do football pools. He would do trivia contests. Uh, he's he's just one of the most fun people to be around that I ever worked with. And we also interviewed someone who uh, is more obsessed with saving money than I am, <laughs> <laughs> and that that's saying a lot. Roger Corman. Well, he's not as much fun as Bruce, of course, but no, um, no I'm kidding. I, Ro, if it wasn't for Roger, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Yeah, he, he's a he's a raconteur. He told us some wonderful stories. And uh, of course, the one about the tennis game being rained out, a story I've yeah. heard, oh, I've heard yeah. you tell. No, it's a it's a it's a great story. And, and uh, Roger has again, uh, you know, you're talking about somebody who. If they had not existed, the firmament of the movie business as we know it today would not exist, because everybody uh, in in the '70s who was who got anywhere were people who started with Roger, and they transformed the entire business. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, Francis Ford Coppola, um, Bogdanovich. Yeah, Jack yeah. Nicholson. Yeah, uh, so many people. Yeah, Ron Howard. Martin Scorsese. I mean, Scorsese. Every, all these all these great people. And and Roger's secret was that he really could. He you know uh, the idea was when you worked for Roger, it was because you know you couldn't work anywhere else because it was all non-union and you didn't know anything. And so Roger would hire people, and he had a great talent for discovering who really cared about the movie and who would work extra hard to make their Women in Cages movie the best Women in Cages movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that, and that, uh, and would work on Sunday, and then Roger would often say, "Well, nobody works for me on Sunday." Well, we all worked for him on Sunday because if we cared, we wanted to do the best job possible. And under the circumstances, which were rather dire, um, you know, he would throw every obstacle in your path that you could imagine, and yet you would still manage to come out with a movie. And all, that's why all those people who went through the Corman School, as we called it. Uh, ended up being, you know, fairly prominent in the business because they really learned their craft. And do you remember any stories about, like, the craziest ways he would save money? Well, one of the things he would like to say was um, sit down a lot. 
and he'd take all the directors out before before they shot, and, and then he would give them advice. And one of them would be sit down a lot because it's difficult. And then, of course, there were no chairs, so he, there was not another place to sit. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing, which I've actually, which I actually ended up using, uh, which everybody thought was apocryphal, but actually was true, was that you can indeed shoot night scenes by your car headlights. And on the on the Howling, we had a generator failure, and we were gonna have to shut down for the day. And I remembered that Roger had said you could shoot scenes by the light of your car headlights. And so we we put all the crew cars together, and we turned the headlights on, and we kept shooting. That's great. Now you, I think, came to fame with the movie Piranha, yes. and that was a movie, if I remember the plot correctly. <laughs> It was about this these creatures who live underwater with powerful jaws and they're eating the swimmers and no one wants to tell anyone about it because it's a vacation community. And Universal Studios uh, said in their legal terms, this is a fucking ripoff of Jaws. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I would use the word fucking. <laughs> but I think it was fairly apparent to all of us yes. that it was indeed a ripoff of Jaws. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't really get involved with it except for the fact that they had a sequel coming up for Jaws, Jaws 2. And that was why they were wanted to protect their franchise. And there were a number of other pictures. There was a picture, uh, there was a couple of shark pictures from Mexico that they managed to get injunctions against and keep off the market. Wasn't there one and called this Great one, White? They tried. They tried to actually keep it off the market. And uh, to my everlasting <laughs> gratitude, Steven Spielberg saw the movie and, and said, no, no, you guys don't understand. It's, it's a spoof. It's a parody of Jaws. It's not a ripoff. Well, that was very kind of him because it really was a ripoff. But... <laughs> I tried to turn it into sort of a parody. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was the movie that put me on the map because it actually made quite a bit of money, particularly considering how little it cost. And and from then on, you and Steven Spielberg worked a lot together. Yes, he uh, had, it turned out he had seen Piranha and I had no idea that he had been an instrumental in getting the picture you know, released and not injuncted. Uh, but then he apparently had seen The Howling, which is a picture I did after Piranha. And uh, he had uh, he liked the performance of Dee Wallace, who was the lead in that picture, and he put her in E.T. And then when it came time for him to start his own company, Amblin, uh, which was in initially conceived as a low-budget film company, uh, he wanted to do a, a low-budget horror film, and he came to me because I had done them before, and uh, he asked me to do a picture that eventually turned out to be Grumbles. Take, take us back a, a couple of steps, uh, uh, Joe, before you, uh, you you made Piranha. I mean, you, you, how'd you get hooked up with Roger Corman in the first place? You started as an editor with him? Well, my friend John Davison, who I had uh, met in Philadelphia, had come out here to be the head of publicity for New World Pictures, which is the company that Roger was running at the time. And um, they needed a trailer editor because they, Roger was annoyed that he kept bringing people in and trying to explain to them how the trailers were made, and then he would have to explain to the new guy how the trailers were made. And so they decided they'd make a trailer department. And so they brought me out, and I started to make uh, some trailers for pictures like Candy Stripe Nurses uh, and Caged Heat, which was Jonathan Demme's yeah, first. Yeah, we know that. We know and those. that picture, both those pictures made money. And so it was like, well, the trailers must have had something to do with it. Let's keep this guy. Uh, and then Alan Arkish uh, came out, was also an NYU buddy of John's, came out. And we became the trailer department for New World Pictures. And we would make all the trailers for the movies. And... Uh, some of the movies were, you know, better than others, and uh, some of them weren't really very good at all. And and but we had to, we, we learned while making trailers that uh, you can uh, take a scene that runs four minutes and you can condense it into thirty seconds by just um, taking the best parts of it. And so when it came, we started to think, well, maybe we could make a movie. And uh, and so we asked Roger if we could make a picture, and he said it was okay as long as it's the cheapest movie they'd ever made there. <laughs> uh, and we all had ten days, and we had to keep making trailers at night. 
So we couldn't figure out how to make a releasable movie under those circumstances until we figured out that if we made a picture that was uh, conceived around the footage that we'd been using in the trailers for other pictures, we could make a movie. And Roger was doing these three girl movies at the time. There were teachers and nurses, and they would like have adventures and take their clothes off and and, and <laughs> left wing, have left wing, vaguely left wing adventures. And um, and we said, well, let's do starlets. Let's do actresses. And then the the movies that the actresses are in, all the scenes that they're in, that we could take from other movies that we've been working on. So we made this picture called Hollywood Boulevard about these three girls who come to Hollywood and make these movies, which are lar- which largely consist of scenes from other movies that already existed. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we did it in 10 days, and we, John, uh, Alan and I directed, co-directed the movie. He would call cut, and I would call action, and then he would set up the next scene, and I would call cut, and he would shoot his scene, and then he'd be finished, and then I'd call action, I'd shoot my scene. Uh, and we managed to get the whole movie made in ten days, and you know it was a pretty ar- pretty arcane movie. Uh, it, it's now kind of kind of a cult following, but at the time it was uh, not exactly didn't exactly set the world on fire. With Paul Bartel and his wife from uh, Paul eating, eating Raoul fame, Paul yeah. Huff were in it. Uh, who had, you know they both uh, Paul made Death Race, which right, which, right. Uh, which Mario was in, and um, the Candace Rawson, who was the reigning B movie queen at the time, was the star. And uh, it's a it's a pretty silly movie, but it's a, a fairly decent picture of actually the way things worked at New World Pictures in the 1970s. And you did the movie Gremlins. Now, Gremlins set off a bunch of ripoff movies, uh, like Ghoulies and Trolls. We, we, we and... don't call them ripoffs; we call them homages. <laughs> You know, there was there was uh, Critters. Oh yeah, Critters. Is, yes, uh, which was one of the best, probably the best ones of those because they were done by the Chiodo brothers, who were like really clever. And, oh, I worked although, with them. Those are the killer yeah, clowns from outer right. space guys. Yeah, those yes. guys are. Those yeah. guys are, are out yeah. there. Yeah. And, I worked uh, with them and Howie Mandel in uh, Adventures of the Amazing Sea Monkeys. Really? Yes. There you go. It must have been in between Gizmo gigs for him. Oh yes. Uh, and then there was, of course, uh, uh, Ghoulies. Oh, yes. It was Charles Band's version. Now, Charles which, Band. which one had Sonny Bono? Uh, <laughs> I think Ghoulies. I think Ghoulies. That sounds safe. And then there was another one called Munchies. Oh, that's which, right. Which was actually made by Roger and, and was directed by Tina Hirsch, who edited Gremlins. And, and the, the thing about Munchies was... And Harvey Corman was in it, and and, and, and so you know there, it, it had its moments. But but the thing about the Munchies were <laughs> they didn't want to have animatronics, and they didn't want to have dolls. So basically, the monsters were played by these clothing remnants that looked kind of like uh, dolls, and that we just sort of throw them around in the frame. <laughs> not a particularly good movie. So, so Roger wound up making a film that was an homage to one of your films. An homage, yes. Yeah, that's a yeah. I, I love how you Glad said... you're picking up on that terminology. I, I love how you said they expected, talking about Corman and working for Corman, how they expected the movies at New World to be bad. So well, that was you, the great thing about yeah. working for Roger, was that, that you know, the, the, the industry, such as it was, and, such a, and any kind of notice that it took of these movies, which was not very much... Uh, was that if you if the movie wasn't terrible, maybe you were talented, and maybe you'd be worth you know bringing on to some you know studio kind of a movie or at least a, a more expensive low budget movie, and that was one of the keys of, of working for Roger, as he often said, uh, if if you're if you're good and you work for me, you won't have to work for me more than twice. Right. And and another unseen star of Gremlins who we've had on this show. Howie Mandel. Yep. Well, Howie, Howie was, was unseen because he, you know, was just doing voices. But Howie was one of the keys to the success of the movie because at the time he had this sort of baby character that he was doing voices with. Uh, and uh, he, he sort of brought that, that childishness to this gizmo 
character who who didn't really have a lot of dialogue in the sense that you could understand it, but there was a sort of a glossary of things that he would say and he would imitate things that people would say, and and how he would do it in this baby voice that was just revoltingly cute. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons, along with the design of the character, which is based on one of Steven Spielberg's dogs, because he kept he kept not approving the design. And we finally said, well, let's make it the same color as his dogs and maybe he'll approve it. Um, and then and when Howie came along, I mean, he really made this thing into a, a character. And I, I actually like the sequel better. Yeah, Gremlins 2 is fun. Well, well they're, a, they're both a, fun. It's a, yeah, it's 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 a closely guarded secret, but I prefer the sequel as well. <laughs> yeah, because there you just went all out. Yeah, it was it's just, wilder. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, they were desperate for a sequel, and they had tried apparently over a number of years. They they came to me right after the first movie, and they said, "Let's make a sequel right away." And I was so exhausted; it was such a difficult movie to make because we were inventing the technology, uh, and no one really believed in it at the time, and so it was. You know, it was a great vindication that it became a big hit. But they came back and they said, let's make another one. I said, no, I can't do it. I'm I'm just, I'm I'm, I'm done. And so they worked on it for five years trying to figure out a reason to make the sequel. But since they didn't really quite get the first movie, I mean, they were happy that it was successful, but they didn't really understand what the appeal was. Uh, They finally came back to me and Mike Fennell, the producer, and they said, well, if you guys will make a sequel for us, you can do whatever you want. And... That's you don't get that kind of offer very often, and 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 so we said, well, let's make a sequel that's about sequels and about how this movie doesn't really need one. Very smart. Uh, <laughs> and and you know we have this character played by John Glover, who is a combination of Donald Trump and uh, Ted Turner, mm-hmm. uh, who started out as the villain, but then as the movie progressed, he became he was uh, John played it so likably that he ended up being kind of a pseudo hero and i can only look back at the current political situation and regret that decision <laughs> <laughs> and i remember a uh, tony randall was in it yes tony randall was the voice of the brain gremlin <laughs> And one of the best days of my life in the movie business was in a new york uh recording studio working with tony randall uh to do this voice which he sort of based on uh, George Plimpton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. And, wow. Uh, and he was just so hilarious and so funny and so witty. Uh, and he came up with so much stuff. I mean, he, he, the, some of the, a lot of the stuff that's in the movie wasn't scripted. I mean, it's just stuff that he, he came up with. And there was this design uh, that didn't exist when we made the first film, uh, which is now completely obsolete, of course, but it was called the Gilder Fluke. And, 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 what it was was it, it it allowed the puppet to move its lips to a pre-recorded track, and so Tony's tracks would be edited, and then they would be played back on set, and the characters would move their lips and look like they were actually speaking. Uh, and it was one of the one of the best aspects of that movie. I mean, it's just it's just so much fun. And today, of course, everything would be CGI, and it would be right, all of course. But I remember he had a little bit of George Sanders mm-hmm. in the character too. Yeah, yeah, a very supercilious attitude. I know, oh, and I, I one funny part is in the original, Phoebe Cates does that whole story about her father dresses up as Santa Claus, mm-hmm. and he falls down the chimney and dies. And then they re- had to redo it in the second one as I think it was Lincoln's birthday. Well, you know, it was a very, that was a very controversial aspect of the first movie with the studio because they really didn't understand what was funny about that scene. And uh, they kept wanting me to cut it out. And I said, no, I, I think this really sort of encapsulates the whole movie because it's funny – but if it happened to you, it's not funny, you know. And 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 so we had to fight about keeping it in the movie. And we had this great preview, and everybody thought it was wonderful. And the studio was thrilled. And they said, "All we have to do is cut out that one speech by Phoebe Cates, and then the picture will be perfect." And I I appealed to Steven Spielberg. I said, "Lee, I I really think I like this scene. I think it's really important, and and it's it's the only character moment she's got in the movie." And he, you know, because he was filmmaker friendly, as Amblin was, 
he said, uh, okay. And the studio was grumbled, but they went, okay. And, and the picture went out and made a lot of money anyway. So when we made the sequel, I couldn't resist doing a riff on that scene. <laughs> <laughs> I like the casting of that uh, of of Gremlins very much too, Joe. What can you tell us about uh, about Key Luke or or Ho- Hoyt Axton or both of them? Well, uh, uh, Key for, for the for Hoyt Axton's part, we saw all these actors. I mean, we saw everybody in town, uh, and and some we saw great actors. We saw Pat Hingle. Oh, love him. And, and did such a reading of this failed inventor that it was as if William Saroyan had written it. And it was like we can't hire him. <laughs> it's it's too he's too it's too real. It's too, <laughs> it's, too it's, it's too emotional. And the same thing with with uh, Polly Holiday's character. I mean, she there were there were moments in the movie where she played Mrs. Deagle as so sympathetically that we had to cut the scene out. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, because it was it was more of a cartoony movie than that. She's great in the film, though. She is wonderful in the film, I, and 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 it was wonderful to work with. But all, all, they all were, and Hoyt was, you know, he, he was he was a great guy. And I, I had I had particularly been impressed with him in the Black Stallion. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, of course, I knew his music and everything. Sure, but, we, we uh, should we should remind our listeners that he was a songwriter. That he wrote "Joy to the World," absolutely, a very big song, and, 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 and never been would, to Spain. Uh, he would serenade the crew at lunch. Yeah, uh, with his a Renaissance you know, man. His, with his his bony fingers, you know, guitar thing. Uh, he was a great guy to have around, and um, it, it was just one of those lucky things where, look, you, the elements fit together. It's the right movie at the right time. If it had come out a year earlier, a year later, seven months earlier, who knows? I mean, but the particular time it came out, it was the movie that was the zeitgeist wanted to see. Mm-hmm. And you uh, use a lot. The old star, well, old supporting actor, Dick Miller. Oh, we love Dick Miller. Well, I'm a, you know, I, I started out as a movie fan before I was a movie maker. And, and I, you know, grew up watching a lot of these people. And um, for me to have a Dick Miller, I had Dick in my first movie because I thought, it's my first movie. It may be only my only movie. <laughs> I, I, I want to put Dick in it. Uh, and because I had always enjoyed watching him. And, of course, we became friends and... He became sort of an avatar for me, and he was in almost every movie I ever did. But then there were other movie, uh, other actors that, that I worked with, like Kevin McCarthy and Bill Shallard and, and Scott Brady and people that I had seen growing up that I always liked. And mm-hmm. I remember the, 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 the meeting I had with Scott Brady for the sheriff in Gremlins. He said, uh, well, you know, my, Mike Fennell and I uh, said, well, you know, we, we went over how much we enjoyed this performance and that performance or whatever. And I guess this guy was so used to going into meetings with people who didn't know who he was that he said, I don't care what the part is. I'll do it. Wow. And that was true with Gail Gordon as well. Oh, yes. Gail Gordon oh. in the Burbs. Yes. He said, no, fine. I, need the, I, I don't care what it, I don't need to read it. I'll do it. Because, you know, there was a there was a, a, a not a lot there, a, during that period. There were there were people who were film buff filmmakers and there were people who were just making films and they weren't necessarily that invested in film history. Mm-hmm. And so they really, when somebody said, well, why don't you see this actor? They really weren't that familiar with their you know previous work. And, you know, since I grew up watching all these people, I was like, I was thrilled to meet people. I, I was supposed to do a movie called The Phantom, which ended up getting made by somebody else. But I remember interviewing Rod Steiger for a part. And, um, I, you know, I, I'd always been very impressed with Rod Steiger. And, and, and he, he practically begged us for the part because he, his career had been, not been going well. And it, it, was, it, it, was a, it was just a very interesting position to be in. For a kid from uh, from Morristown, New Jersey, who's who's going to revival theaters and watching these people, and and uh, and here you are, and it's not that many years later, you're auditioning them for your movies. Absolutely, it had to be I mean, an, an out of body experience. It's true. You know, I mean, you get you people that you thought you would never even get to meet, let alone work with. Right. And then when you did get to work with them, I mean, of course, the majority of them, I I, I can't think of an actor who disappointed me in the sense that well he's an asshole you know i mean i i I didn't i just never encountered any of those and at the rod steiger story brings me back to a story that rod steiger said later in his life 
he was meeting with a producer. He was up for a movie, and the producer said to him, well, this is a Southern character. Can you do a Southern accent? Oi. <laughs> Didn't know their history. <laughs> How old is in the heat of the night by then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I think Steiger said, well, I, I won an Academy Award for my Southern accent. And, he, and the producer said, well, do you have a copy of this film? <laughs> Well, look, I mean, that gets, that gets into a whole different area of discussion, which is, uh, you know, film history. And, and we live in a, in, a, in a time when there are more movies available, if you care to look for them, than have ever been available in my lifetime. And when I was a kid, you know, you went to the movies. Uh, if you liked, saw a movie you liked, uh, you would wait five years and maybe you'd see it on TV. And if you missed that TV showing, you'd have to wait another year and a half before another TV showing. I mean, that was, was just the way things work. Now, I, there's so many things available to see that have been restored or, you know, on the digital or whatever. But yet, the majority of people are completely unfamiliar with anything that was made before 1990. I remember when I was a kid, I would look, I would check the local listings of Route 66 every day to see if they'd be showing, I think it was uh, Lizard's Tale and Owlet's Wing. I'm sure Joe's right. familiar right. with it. <laughs> Forrest Karloff, Cheney Jr., and Peter Lorre. Right. And the one day I didn't check the listing that was on. <laughs> and you wanted to kill yourself. Yes. Right. Well, but, you know, when, when, when I was a kid, TV Guide was your Bible. Oh, oh yeah. sure. I mean, that was what they had a listing of movies in the front. And it was like, what movies are going to run this week and where? And that was like, OK, uh, that was the only place you could go to find that stuff out. Now, of course, you know, there's I mean, with, with, with Wikipedia and IMDb. I mean, there's all this information available and all sorts of discussions about movies that you could never have because you know when I, as a kid uh you didn't even know if there were people who really liked the kind of stuff that you liked and it, it really took the emergence of famous monsters of film later in 1958 for right. kids to realize that there were other kids geeky kids out there like themselves from you know, famous oh God, there's other kids who like these movies <laughs> from <laughs> famous of monsters of filmland i have a few feet for me in my house a poster of Frankenstein, that six foot poster they used to sell in the back. In right. the back. Right. The Captain Company. And I had, I ordered one of these in the ads. They called it Herman the Asiatic Insect. And you'd see some enormous insect with <laughs> fangs and claws and hair. And I ordered it and it came in like a little like the size of a matchbox <laughs> and it was a stick with some fur glued on it and rubber bands for antennas but that was the whole secret of all those comic book ads oh like, yeah you know thousands of soldiers you know and you buy them and it turns out they're so skinny yeah. <laughs> you turn them sideways they're they're like the size of a, they're, they're like razor blades i mean like nothing there <laughs> And there was one called Surprise Package. Do you remember this right. one? Oh. With just the question marks yes. around it, and you didn't even know what you were going to get. How about X-ray specs? X-ray specs. Oh, yeah. yes, for yeah. every horny kid those. out there. Because <laughs> so, you'd see the dorky kid would be staring at a girl and seeing her naked body underneath it. So, of course, every boy wanted those. Right. Johnson Smith, wasn't that the name of the, the, uh, the catalog? Johnson Smith catalog. Yeah, yes. yeah, that sold all that stuff. Wait, are we and, old? Wow. Yeah, yeah, we are. Oh, and <laughs> the, you used to be able, and this was the most crooked thing ever, you used to be able to order monkeys by sea mail monkeys. order. No, sea monkeys. No, no, real monkeys. <laughs> Where did you order real monkeys? Real monkeys. monkeys. <laughs> And it was, it was totally, it was totally black market shit. And they would send you, they would, you would get a monkey. I thank God I never ordered it. Are you serious? But the person who ever got a monkey. The monkeys, when they, when the kids received them, the monkeys were either dying or dead. Are you, 
Are you serious? I they swear to so God, bad, they, horrible. they were monkeys you could <laughs> buy by mail. Oh, God. It was, it was the most total black market. You learned something every day, Joe. Midgets and suits. They weren't. <laughs> Midgets and suits. Since, and, and by the way, since we brought up Famous Monsters of Filmland, you wrote for Famous Monsters of Filmland at one point, Joe. To validate your existence, you had to get your name in Famous Monsters. And and uh, as a letter, you'd write a letter, and if it got published, you were like a celebrity. So I wrote all these letters. I wrote the, the best movies I'd ever seen, the scariest movies I'd ever seen, and finally I wrote the worst movies I'd ever seen. And that one got turned into an article, uh, even though I hadn't seen like about 15 of the movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that counts. And. And you wrote but for I became a celebrity. You wrote for Castle of Frankenstein, another film Castle magazine. Castle of Frankenstein was the magazine that was for people who were too old for famous monsters. Okay, I remember. I remember. Our our crack research team. <laughs> Look out, Joey! He's got a cell phone. <laughs> found found an ad here. Man's account of ordering a live monkey from a comic book ad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a drawing of a monkey, America's most amusing pet, the squirrel monkey. Good, healthy. How, how could the FDA allow this? I mean, it's... <laughs> oh, you could get away with all this shit back then. Oh, and you could get it for just th- 13 95 <laughs> A what, live what it, monkey. Sh- shipped it in a box? I mean, uh... <laughs> yeah, probably with no holes in it to breathe. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> I bet John Landis ordered one. He loves a monkey. <laughs> and talking about your childhood, uh, since we're talking about it, Joe, and, and Gilbert's childhood, you're a local kid. You're from New Jersey. Jersey, yeah. yeah and I thought you're, you're doing research about you. It was very touching, your story about going, your, your dad. I mean, your dad was a golf pro. He was on the road a lot. Uh, him taking you to see Tarantula, I thought that was such a sweet story. Well, you know, I, I, the movie theater, the, the local movie theater used to play movies uh, Monday, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, Sunday. So if you, if you on Thursday, the movie is over. And like I saw the trailer for Tarantula and I really wanted to see it. And my father, I begged him to take me. And he was, you know, he got up really early and he came back really late. And he took me to see the movie. And I was so scared that. I hung out in the lobby. I was I was pacing in the lobby. I remember the manager like laughing at me and <laughs> elbowing the cashier saying, Look at this kid, he can't take it. Leaving my father alone to watch a giant spider movie by himself. Now I remember like Tarantula is to use your words, Joe, an homage to the movie <laughs> Them. Yes, indeed. Right, but right. it's the best homage. And and the funny all the ones that followed were worse. The funny thing is, them is the respected film, and I like Tarantula better. No, well, them is a better movie. Is that the one James Whitmore? Yeah, uh, them. Yeah, I mean, yes. that's, that's really, good. That's really a really good movie. It's good. I mean, it's really well written and it's really well paced. And it's and and I must add that I had seen them, of course, and I had nightmares for years. Because the sounds of the ants sounded somewhat like crickets. And, of course, they, we had crickets in the backyard of my house. And the, them takes place in the desert. And the back of my house was – there was a, a development that had been raised. And it was full of concrete and it sort of sticking up out of the ground. And it looked kind of like a desert. And then in the wind, the leaves – uh, the the branches, the trees would 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 scratch against my windows, and it was like giant ant antennas. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents would say, "Why do you see these movies when they make you have nightmares?" And and I, my only answer was, "I can't help it. I just <laughs> I just love these movies. I love being scared, and that's why I ended up making so many horror movies." That's great. It's a good story. And. Because, uh, I, I mean, I remember Tarantula is the one with Leo J. Carroll. Right. Leo G. Carroll. Yeah, yep. And that's, that's the reason I wanted to see it, because he was on Topper, which was a TV show that yes. was that's right. very popular at the time. Wasn't he on and, as a, a, and he was actually one of Hitchcock's favorite actors. He was why do in, I remember him being in, in It Takes a Thief with Robert Wagner? Was he in that show? Probably. Leo G. He's Carroll? The man from Uncle. Oh, The Man from Uncle. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's, that's right. right. That's, that's right. right. He I'm was the... Uh, the head of the the yeah. organization, right? Yeah, 
Right, right, right. And I remember in Tarantula, it's all based on finding a cure for, as they called it, acromegalia. Which is actually acromegaly. I, I know. Oh, yeah, we've talked about it on the show a lot. It was based on a science fiction theater episode about uh, called No Food for Thought, which was about creating artificial nutrients. And the, that's the backbone of the basic story of, of, of Tarantula, which is that in creating the artificial nutrients, they create giantism and they have giant, you know, uh, guinea pigs and giant rats and, and this giant spider, which was, you know, it was scary when it was 50 feet tall, but it was a lot scarier when I was a kid when it was only three feet tall and it was under my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of big. Uh, the guy, the king of the big films, who we uh, we named our show after, and that's uh, Bert I. Gordon. Yeah, we were just talking about him. Mr. Big. Yes, and he was always, he was just always making things larger for his <laughs> movies. Lizards, bugs, right. everything. <laughs> And yeah, I don't think he did any small things. He didn't. He didn't do any incredible shrinking man kind of things. That was Jack Arnold. Yeah, and he's still with us, Bert Gordon, in his nineties. Bert is still around, and he is still working. Yeah, we we wow. on MDB. He's got a picture. We're going to pursue him for this show if it kills us. I think it's a great idea. He's he, he's not particularly loquacious. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll one, do a short one. One person. Frank and I would have loved to have had on the podcast, and that's Sammy Petrillo. Oh yeah, well we went to we we discovered the the website Joe, and we're absolutely in love with it with with uh, with trailers from hell. And the first one that we saw was Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla. Well, I remember seeing that picture when I was a kid on TV under the title "Boys from Brooklyn," and I was a yeah. huge Ben Lewis fan. And as a as a seven year old or eight year old or however I was. I thought, this really is this really a Martin and Lewis movie that I never heard of? Because they they actually were a pretty good approximation of of Martin and Lewis. Yeah. Well, same uh, Petrillo more than Dookie Mitchell. Yeah, Petr- yeah. yeah that's Petrillo true. was like an exact replica. Well, and- Jerry had hired him apparently as to play Baby Jerry on an episode of the Colgate Comedy Hour. And uh, I guess Sammy figured, well, this is a pretty good gig. And he, you know, continued to, to play Jerry, much apparently to Jerry's distress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I heard that, I think Hal, Hal, uh, Hal Wallace, who produced the Martin and Lewis movies, at first wanted to call a, get a lawsuit to stop uh, Bay Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla. But when he saw he saw clips of it and he saw how terrible it was, he thought it's not even worth it. <laughs> well, it didn't exactly, you know, set the guys on a large career trajectory. You no. know, <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad knew Dookie Mitchell growing up in Brooklyn. Not for nothing, as they used to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, he didn't have a big career either. No, but uh, but Sammy per, uh, persisted for many years, uh, apparently doing a, a variation of that act. Yeah, it's 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 a strange film. It's very creepy. It's like yeah. you feel like you are watching a Martin and Lewis movie, but it's a Martin and Lewis nightmare. Yeah, no, it's it's an alternate world, a bizarro world. Yes, um, is this, yes. Is this one time we don't have to use the word homage? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> now, you were going to do a Jaws 3. Oh, Jaws 3 people, nothing. Yeah. I was supposed to do, after I did uh, Piranha, I got a lot of offers for aquatic movies. Uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of barracuda kind of movies, and uh, I, I work with Dino De Laurentiis briefly on a on Orca Two. Oh wow! And yes. Dino said, "Orca, he's a come on crazy. He's a kill everybody." Uh, <laughs> but what he said was that, Orca, that was great. <laughs> Orca was going to uh, go on land. And kill people and leave seaweed at the crime scene. Uh, 
this actually didn't strike me as a particularly viable idea. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to talk him out of it. So the whale was was the whale gonna walk on the line? He's gonna crazy. He's a <laughs> 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 So then I got offered Jaws 3 um, by the National Lampoon, by Maddie Simmons, who was running the National Lampoon, and in conjunction with the Zanuck and Brown people who had done Jaws 2. And John Hughes, the late John Hughes, was one of the writers of the script. And the idea was that it was going to be a comedy version of Jaws. Uh, the problem was that the National Lampoon people wanted to make an R-rated version, and the Universal people wanted to make a PG. And so they couldn't really decide on the tone of the movie. And we we, we got fairly far with it. I mean, we had uh, Bo Derek was hired to star, or, or at least we talked to her about it. Uh, and the the problem became that there was just so much tension involved in the two different approaches that the movie ultimately never got made, and um, which was lucky for me because I was able to bail out and and do the howling, on which I replaced somebody who was supposed to do a different version of the howling, and it, I think Jaws Three People Zero probably, under the circumstances I was dealing with, uh, wouldn't have been a very good movie. I think the script is available online. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure which script that is. Oh, okay. I'm curious. I, I've never I, read it. I'm curious. I was sitting at my desk cutting up with the scissors different versions of the script and pasting them together. So I'm not sure which wow. version. Now, with The Howling, I heard they had originally started work on American Werewolf in London, and Rick Baker was devising all the transformation scenes. And Rob Bottin was an apprentice. Well, that's true. Rob yeah. was uh, Rick's apprentice, and Rob had worked with me on uh, Piranha. Uh, and we went to Rick uh, when The Howling came about, and Rick had been intending to do John Landis's movie, The American Werewolf in London, but uh, the financing never came together. So Rick said, well, okay, you know, I mean, you know, if John's movie isn't going to happen, I'll do yours. And magically, as soon as Rick <laughs> said he would do ours and John found out about it, uh, suddenly Polly Grant came up with some money and John was making his movie. And Rick said, I, you know, I really promised John I, I, I have to do his movie. But, and he had done some tests for us that were really pretty remarkable. Uh, but I'm going to leave it in the hands of Rob. And so you guys make your movie and we'll make our movie. And I think we met our movie first, and I think we were finished first, but John's movie was much more expensive than was a studio picture and came out a little later. And Howling's a lot of fun. How, it is, because Howling's one of those movies that it's like not a comedy, but certainly filled with laughs, like sick laughs. Oh, and wonderful it. in jokes. Well, it was a movie supposedly for people who like werewolf movies. And I figured I might not ever get to make another one. Uh, and so I wanted to put all of my werewolf lore interest uh, into this one movie. And, uh, you know, it was, it was made for a small company called Avico Embassy, which at the time was making pictures like scanners. Uh, and uh, we're having some success with it. Um, uh, and uh, it, it became a surprise hit. Even though it was a pretty low budget movie, yeah. I I remember one scene where they're in someone's office, and on the desk is a little framed portrait of Lon Chaney Jr. And it's it, it came from it was Rob Bottin's original picture of Lon Chaney Jr., who was like seventeen or eighteen in in the picture. Uh, and uh, we just felt that you know we needed to make all the homages. <laughs> that we could get away with uh, in this picture. And also the trick was that, you know, at the time, werewolf movies are considered kind of corny uh, because there hadn't been really very many successful ones and, uh, lately. And, and uh, you know, everybody associated them with The Late Late Show. And so we sold it as a, as a slasher movie. Uh, and the, we kept the supernatural elements out of the ad campaign and even out of the movie until the first half hour is over. So that the audience would be gradually, supposedly, you know, uh, dragged in to believing uh, in what is always a problem in horror movies, which is the suspension of disbelief. 
I love that you named so many characters after the director of the directors of werewolf movies too. That was a wonderful show. Yeah, that joke. was that was that was my idea. I wanted to call all the direct characters uh, after the directors of werewolf movies, except for John Sayles, the writer. Uh, right. he, was, he was a big baseball fan, so the, all the characters who aren't named after werewolf directors are named after baseball players. I love that. And there's one scene where D. Wallace Stone has to meet a guy in a porno theater. And I think they said D. Wallace Stone was very afraid of going into a porno theater. Well, she was, uh, she was, and is a very sensitive person. And uh, when we, 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 the porno booth scene was shot on a stage, but the porno place was actually on Western Avenue, and it was a real porno store. And her, the discomfort that you see on screen. Uh, of her walking into the store and looking at the covers of these magazines is real. <laughs> that, is, that is not acting. That is her. <laughs> and and I remember what's funny is when she's, uh, the guy is attacking her mm-hmm. who's turning into a werewolf, and you hear outside the porno booth all these, like, loud growls and screams. <laughs> Well, you know, if you've ever been in a porno movie. Oh, maybe. yeah. <laughs> maybe he has once or twice. <laughs> Joe, Joe, there's so many directions we can go in. There's so many things that we have to ask you about matinee, because since we talked about Burt Gordon, we have to talk about the great William Castle. And it's my personal favorite Joe Dante movie. Well, I um, um, Matinee uh, came to me as a uh, script by a writer named Jericho Stone, who uh, had envisioned it as a movie about uh, people who are uh, lamenting the loss of a movie theater that's being knocked down and turned into a video store. Uh, and it, it was much more of a fantasy um, about you know they're they remembering their. Their visits to the theater where the projectionist was a vampire and the usher was a, you know, a, a monster and all, and that just didn't sell. So uh, when we tried to reimagine it as a more realistic picture, uh, the idea of coming up with it uh, as a uh, Cuban Missile Crisis 1962 movie uh, seemed a little bit more realistic, and so therefore. Uh, the character in the original script, who was a horror movie star, who was making a personal appearance, became a horror movie director who was trying out his his new science fiction movie um, in Key West in 1962. And, and the, the whole idea, of course, was that uh, it juxtaposes the real fear that I had. I mean, it's a, it's a semi-autographic autobiographical movie for me because I was the age of the lead kid in 1962 and we did believe that weekend that there would be no Monday and there would be no school and the world would be over. Uh, And so uh, there's a lot of realism in that picture. I mean, all of the the, uh, reenactments of the the kind of drills, the duck and cover drills and stuff that we had at the time are, Mm -hmm. are very accurate. And when you approached John Goodman and you said you, you were going to have to give him an education about Castle, but he didn't need one. No, I thought that John Goodman, I, I, I put together a reel of Castle trailers to show John Goodman. He said, I don't need to see that. I know who he is. And, um, you know, he's not in exactly William Castle because William Castle didn't make those kind of movies. He made straight horror movies. Sure. He didn't make science fiction movies. And by in, in any case, by 1962, nobody was making giant monster movies. But um, still, it, it, you know, it, it was enough close enough to the real story that it does i think have a certain authority and um it's it's a pretty it's a pretty convincing version of how people felt in 1962 i i I know from my experience it's very accurate i didn't live in key west i lived in new jersey and i never was lucky enough to have a horror movie guy come (laughs) come to my neighborhood (laughs) if that was the case i think it would have been like this movie and since we spoke about tarantula and and uh, them we should talk about mant which was the movie within matinee half man half ant all terror it's wonderful (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, Absolutely you know, wonderful. We were we we were confronted with two concepts. One of which is make fun of it by making it shitty, 
And the other one is, let's try to do a kind of a realistic version of what this kind of movie was in that era. And so the special effects are kind of state of the art for 1962. And um, the movie itself looks kind of, you know, with the kookalorises and the style of shooting, it looks like a kind of a, a Columbia B movie. And um, there's uh, there's a lot of um, co uh, quotes from actual dialogue from 50s science fiction movies, many of which were by Burt Gordon, um, where we literally stole the dialogue. I mean, it's, it's, uh, word for word. <laughs> and that's part of what makes it fun. Yeah, and the Disney, the Disney film, too, the, the Shook Up Shopping Cart, is also wonderful. Well, that's a pretty accurate trend. I mean, uh, who, who, who of my generation can't remember the, the horror of having to sit through oh, yeah. movies that was like, holy crow, there's just nothing interesting in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, now, it's like it's from my parents. Or something. And you were going to do Godzilla Reborn. Well, Michael Schlesinger and I were going to do a Godzilla Reborn movie for Sony, and it was sort of a spoof, but then they, the Toho people, I think, kind of cooled on it, because I think they saw bigger paychecks in the future. And speaking of other projects, uh, tell us what's happening with A Man with Kaleidoscope Eyes. Well, The Man of Classical Buys is a movie uh, which uh, has been written by Tim Lucas and, and uh, Charlie Largent and um, Michael Almoreda, and um, it's, uh, it's a movie about Roger Corman making the trip and, uh, in 1967 and how it changed him and how the act of taking LSD uh, in order to you know, be true to the movie, as Peter Fonda and Jack Nicholson insisted he do, uh, changed him and changed his view of the world and changed all of our views of what the world was like. Uh, and it's a very funny movie and I think really pertinent and interesting. And we have been working on it for low these many years, almost a decade. Uh, and, and we still haven't gotten it made, but we have not given up. We're still um, exploring every avenue, I believe is the phrase. I hope it happens for the love well, of God. Oh, but it happens too. We find it funny, the two that Dern, we were talking to Bruce Dern, and he didn't take drugs at all. And, you no, know, Bruce he, doesn't drink, he doesn't yeah. smoke, he doesn't take drugs. I mean, he is a pure, all he does is run, which I don't think he can do anymore uh, because of his you know, physical condition. But he was he's one of those guys who is just into the adrenaline thing. Yeah, yeah. And you worked with John Carradine. I worked with John Carradine in uh, The Howling. I tried to get him for Piranha, but he didn't have a high enough TV queue. Uh, and, and the part of the deal of making Piranha was you had to sell it to a network. And so they had to, well, you got to, these people are approved and you can hire them. And so we hired Keenan Wynn instead. But when I, when I worked for John, uh, with John on The Howling, uh, he uh, was in a period where he was literally doing anything. I mean, he, was, he had ex-wives to support. And, you know, <laughs> You know, a, a lot of reasons to do anything that came his way. But um, I spent so much time talking to him and uh, that I would, I would literally do the slates at the beginnings of the shots so that he could tell me stories while they were adjusting the lights. And then I would click the slate and we'd do the scene, and then I'd do another take to hear the end of the story. Wow. <laughs> any, any, any you can remember? Oh, he had stories about everybody. He worked from everybody from Jean Ford to Jean Renoir. I mean, he, he was, uh, he, and he remembered everything. I mean, he was, he had an, an incredible memory. And he was just, a great, him, him and Slim Pickens was in that movie. I mean, uh, Patrick McNee. I mean, all these great mm -hmm. people. I mean, one of the great things about making these movies is that you get to work with people that you had always admired and grew up watching and you know always wanted to be able to talk to and uh the, the problem with low budget movies is there isn't any time to talk to them right speaking of Carradine I found it interesting uh, a quote you said uh, you were talking about Carradine and Walter Brennan and people like that that they would make 200 films or 300 films and you said people can't have that kind of career anymore because the well, business they, has changed it's not possible because, you know, in the, in the studio system, there was a, a pool of people that you could work from. And uh, the movies were largely made in, in, in the same place. And so people had a lot of chance to be seen and discovered and understood. And, you know, uh, 
uh, a guy who's known to be a drunk can play drunks, and he's the guy who plays drunks. And there's another guy who's, you know, blows his top, and he's the guy who blows his top, and he, that's his career. Uh, and and but you can't do that anymore because uh, first of all, there's just not enough continuity. And if you look at the number of TV shows there are currently out. Um, that no one can keep track of and that are using up constantly new, new, new actors. Um, nobody really has a chance to make that kind of connection. Uh, every so often you get a Walton Goggins or somebody like that who's managed to make a, you know, a big splash at a particularly, you know, well-watched show and then gets a part in a big movie and then that's a career. But that used to be much easier to do. That used to be much more common than yep. it is now. And I, I've heard stories uh, in the studio system, not only the supporting actors, but the stars, since it was all on the same set, would do one scene of a movie and then rush across to the other. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not, actors are still doing that. I mean, I just did an episode of Legends of Tomorrow, which is a new show on the CW. And, you know, they're, they're often shooting more than one episode at a time. So actors have to, you know, run around, and change clothes, and you know, learn the scenes, learn the script for another scene. I mean, whether it's a different movie or a different episode, it's still the same, you know, concept. Um, it, there's just a lot. It, it, it's things are done, you know, to save money. I mean, that's why people <laughs> do stuff. I mean, you know, and and uh, it, it's um, it's hectic. It's very hectic. I want to ask you about uh, a couple of the other these other names, uh, if, if you have any memories at all, Joe. Uh, Slim Pickens, you mentioned. Gilbert's obsessed with Kevin McCarthy. We've talked about him on the podcast a lot. Oh, Kevin, I, I work with numerous times. Uh, the first time in, the, um, in Piranha, uh, where he played a part that was vacated by Eric Braden, uh, because Eric Braden had done a couple of days in a swimming pool playing this part. Uh, and he saw how tatty our production was, and he called me up and he said, you know, I just can't do this. This is just not something I can do. And so we had to replace him. And uh, Kevin um, was in New York, and he apparently walked around Central Park deciding whether or not to do it, but he was friends with Bradford Dillman, who was the star of the movie, and so he said yes. And we got along, and then I had Kevin in the Twilight Zone movie, and I had him in The Howling, and I had him in inner space, and I, 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 we became great friends. And uh, he was one of my favorite actors before I even met him. So it, it, that way, it, there, there, and Henry Gibson is another character who is somebody that I always admired, and particularly when I saw The Long Goodbye, and I saw how great his character was, and how different it was from the laughing image that oh, yeah. he. Had. He's great, great in Nashville, yeah, too. It was like, oh, well, this is another guy I really like. And the, the, the problem with amassing these people is that, you know, you want to put them in every movie, but, you know, they may not be a part for them. You know, you can't. I got to a point where I was reading scripts and I was going, where's the part for Dick Miller? And I and I, I started to kick myself in the head like I can't turn down movies just because there's no part for <laughs> Or you know? Kathleen Freeman. And I, exactly. And I can't have him playing <laughs> Kathleen Freeman's part just to have him in the movie. So, uh, you know, but but the great thing about it is that you do work with people. I mean, I just did a picture with Anton Yelchin, who is a, a wonderful actor, and I would love to work with him again. And, and so you, you get all these people, you know, that you've worked with, and you just, they become part of your stock company. I mean, look at Ingmar Bergman, look at John Ford, look at Preston Sturgis. You see the same faces over and over and over. It's not just because they're good, it's because they're copacetic. They're people yeah. that you can work with. Oh, we love Picardo, by the way, speaking of the Joe Dante stock company. Oh, oh yes. You know, Bob is Bob is wonderful, and and uh, you know, I've, I've, yeah, he's we love <laughs> his him. agent. He, he, he once called me and said, that, "You know, my agent says I can't work for you anymore because you keep asking me to work for scale." Because <laughs> 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 you know, when you, you you do these movies and and, and TV shows, and they're all they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and it's like, well, you know, that's and and they give the stars more and more money, so there's less and less money for the supporting people. And uh, you see, uh, well, call your friends, have them come in and help you. And it's sort of like, well, geez, you know, how often can you do that? Yeah. <laughs> what about, uh, we won't keep you, but just, just uh, as, as we start to wrap this up, what, what about Brother Theodore? Any Brother st Theodore. Any st was, we loved him. 
Brother Theodore, I had been uh, seeing in ads in the Village Voice when I was uh, going to college about, you know, his one man show. And uh, I actually attended one of them in New York. At the 13th Street Theater? Exactly. It was there forever. I know. And uh, he was unique, to say the least. And uh, and when it came time to cast this Klopek character in The Burbs, we saw a lot of really interesting people. We saw um, uh, uh, Timothy Carey, who is you know notoriously known to have tied up Otto Preminger in a room to try to get a part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and Tim Carey was great, and he actually uh, he, he he pursued me for a while. He, he would like show up because he was looking for this part of me. But but there was nobody like Brother Theater. I mean, um, he was he was uh, more than a little deaf, and so you would have to. I remember Carrie Fisher like doing her lines at you know eighty seven decibels just to get in his cue. Um, but. Uh, he was one of a kind. He was just amazing, and he was such a sweet guy. And because he was elderly, there was a, a, a young guy who was assigned to be his sort of minder, and you know, make sure he had everything he wanted. And uh, so I didn't really get to talk to him as much as I would have liked to. But uh, and and uh, as as in most movies, there were reshoots. You know, there's always reshoots on movies. At one movie, I, I refused to shoot the ending because I told them, "I know you're going to redo it, so why don't we just not do the ending and we'll just preview it and then we'll go shoot the real ending." Uh, and in this case, he came back uh, to do um, some real endings, and he, he and Corey Feldman had an interesting dynamic. But um, <laughs> I, I just, I really, I really loved working with this guy, and uh, I was very sorry to hear of his passing. Yeah, I had the pleasure of meeting him at the 13th Street Theater a couple of times. Did you ever meet him, Gil? Uh, Brother no. Theodore? You, you There's wait. a documentary uh, that I, I participated in, which I don't know if it was ever finished, about him. He, his stage show was terrifying. He would just oh, he put a flash, flashlight under his chin and, and underlight himself oh, and, just, yeah. and just scream at the audience. And, and, but it was so funny because he was in person. He was such a yeah, quiet, he, sweet guy. He was. He was gentle. <laughs> And you do a website series called um, Trailers from Hell. A wonderful series. Well, Trailers from Hell came from the fact that I was I used to I started making trailers for Corman, and, and I was a big trailer fan, and I collected thirty five millimeter trailers, and I had this huge, you know, warehouse of trailers, and I thought nobody's seeing them. I, in the old days, in, in in L.A. when I first came out in the seventies, there were theaters where you could just film buffs could bring reels of trailers and at midnight they would open it up for free and everybody would sit and watch three hours of trailers and get stoned and it was great but those days were long gone and it was sort of like well how are people going to see these so I thought well maybe I could put them up on the internet and then I thought well but anybody can do that why don't, why don't I do a couple of commentaries so I picked some trailers and for some horror movies and I, and I did some commentaries for them and I put them up uh, on the internet and to no particular interest on the part of anybody except some friends of mine who said well I have a couple of pictures I'd like to talk about and so it gradually grew people like you know John Landis and Edgar Wright and Guillermo del Toro and all these people who are friends of mine said well you know there's movies I'd like to talk about and it's now grown over seven years to over a thousand trailers with commentaries by all these different filmmakers. And, and, and we, we basically tried to limit it to people who are actually filmmakers and, and, and you know, not um, academics and not critics, uh, people who actually work in the business. And so we've got writers and, and, and makeup people and all sorts of people. Uh, and the great thing about the site is that, we, and we have three different trailers every week. And the great thing about the site is when people come up to me and say, "I saw this movie talked about on your site, and I went and re I rented it, and I really liked it, and I now I like this director, or I like this actor, or writer, or whatever, and I want to see more movies by them." And it makes me feel sort of like I'm giving back because there's so much to see these days. There's so many ways for people to you know spend their time as opposed to when i was a kid where there was like literally radio television uh movies and sports you know and that was it and your uh, family and didn't get a television till late we we didn't get a television till the till the, the, the late early 50s i used to have to go to other people's houses to watch disneyland you know um, and but now every, everything is available if you can but but somebody's got to say well here's something you should 
see, here's something that I should call your attention to. And that's the that's the great thing about the show. I mean, we don't make any money on it, obviously, but it, but it's it just makes me feel like you know, it's uh, something that's worthwhile. Well, we can't endorse it enough. We want to tell our our, our listeners that you've got to check out Trailers from Hell. It's you, John Landis, John Sales, uh, uh, your old buddy Alan Arkish, Rick Baker, uh, Larry Karaszewski, who we had on the show. Uh, they're not only commentaries for, uh, you know, B movies, fun B movies like Robot Monster and Brooklyn Gorilla, which we talked about, but also good films like Wells the Stranger and The Innocents, and and, well, and also new. We do new movies, and Brian Churchill Smith right. tries to do uh, lots of new. He did Mad Max. I mean, you know, the new Mad Max movie. Uh, we we try to you know be wide ranging, but it's basically you know uh, the the people choose their own movies to tell. Gilbert, if we, we find a trailer for it, great. If we can't find a trailer, then they can't do it. I remember watching Disney's World of Color in in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd see all these lines and explosions, and I'd watch it and go, I don't understand what's so impressive about this. It was to get you to buy a color TV. <laughs> right. And Joe, you have a nice story about that, about not being able to, to, to see Disney and... Uh... Well, I was, you know, we didn't get a TV. Uh, I had polio when I was a kid, and and uh, we didn't have a TV. And and um, but the Disneyland show was on. And I was a huge Disney freak. I mean, uh, like most people in my generation, he was like God. And so they would. I remember being carried in a blanket across the street to see the Disneyland TV show at my friend Randy Crawford's house because they had a TV. Well. Wow. Just knock on the door. Is can our... Like weeping? <laughs> say, say it again, Joe. I'm sorry. It, it's such a poignant story. I can't believe you're not weeping. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I stopped saying the word fuck for three seconds, so that... <laughs> it's the virtue of a podcast. You can say whatever you want. Yes. Uh, I have to say, we were watching Trailers from Hell before we called you, and uh, I, I dare say, this is how educational the site is, I think Gilbert saw a Bela Lugosi, George Zucco movie that he wasn't familiar with. Yes. <laughs> and that's saying something. Must be scared to death, right? Scared to death. Oh, right. yes, yes. It's, it's, it was one of Bela's few color movies. I, I saw, I remember with Scared to Death, I just remember seeing photos of him with a midget. And... No, so the scenes with him and the midget are great. And by the way, we don't call them midgets anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, you're not the first guest to correct him on that. <laughs> and and you did one on Bride of the Gorilla. Yes, yes, Bride That's of the Gorilla, it. which is I, I well, and, and and John Landis did Bride and the Beast, which was uh, written by Ed Wood, in which the the heroine wears an angora sweater through the entire picture. Oh yes, there's some good Cheney <laughs> pictures on uh, on your page. Oh yeah. yeah. No, I, I try to I try to get to the movies we really care about. Other people do the Oscar winners. <laughs> it's a it's a great site. Uh, so I just want to tell uh, our fans, uh, trailers from hell. I mean, you will lose days. I lost hours and hours on that site, yeah, Joe. That's what it's for. Trailersfromhell dot com. It, yeah, it's wonderful. And it's and also you, on YouTube. And one we, of my we favorite. Like it better when you watch it on our site. <laughs> one of my favorite movies you talked about on there, The Tingler. Oh yeah. Oh, well, who can, I mean, have you, have you ever seen The Tingler actually with the seat buzzers? No. No, in Percepto? Yes. Yeah. Well, the great thing about the seat buzzers, and we, we did this at matinee, was that um, they weren't in every seat. They were like in every third or fourth seat. So that when you were sitting in the in the, in the the row, all of a sudden the guy, one, one person over, was like freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't know why. I mean, it was really clever and also saved money. <laughs> and that's the one where uh, the tingler gets loose in a movie theater and the whole movie goes black and Vincent Price is screaming, scream, scream for your lives. Exactly. That's the <laughs> he did that for uh, Victoria Price, Joe. She was very and, there's a simil- and there's a similar scene in uh, Gremlins 2 where the film breaks and the gremlins take over. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, we're we going to have to get William Castle's daughter uh, on the show, too. Uh, you should. She's she's really nice. Yeah. Uh, and very, very smart and articulate. 
and Victoria also is a, a person to be great to have. We had Victoria. Oh, did you? When yeah. we and we had Ron Chaney. Oh, good. And we had Sarah Karloff. I mean, oh, this, this is this. Are those all the horror, and, ho- and Hollywood horror museum people? We had Janet Ann Gallo, who was the little. God, is she still alive? You're not going to yes. stump him. He knows who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Just as he was starting to explain who it was, I said, nope, Joe's going to know who that is. You're like the only person who I How say that she? name to who doesn't say well, who. If she, was, if she was five or six in 1942, yeah. she would be what? She's not that old. She's in her 70s. Wow. Yeah. And alert. Well, she's actually and... only a little older than I am, I'm sad to say. <laughs> <laughs> she was thrilled to hear from us, Joe. I'll bet. <laughs> and she said how she... Where as a little girl would play hide and go seek with Lon Chaney and Beta Lugosi. Oh, there you go. How many people can say that? <laughs> right. And I think Lon Chaney wanted to adopt her. I, I heard that. Yeah. I, he, he, was, he was so taken with her. But uh, but did she not have parents? She had a, her father was still alive, and yeah. he said, "No, I'm her father." <laughs> I'm yeah. not surprised. <laughs> But I think she kind of felt bad that she wasn't adopted by Cheney because she liked him. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, you have no idea how excited and thrilled he is that you knew who Janet Ann Gallo was without an explanation. Well, this is a pretty esoteric show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one we try to do every week. I can see. <laughs> well, we thank you. It was a thrill. And you're like one of those people we could have spent another five hours talking well to. thank god you didn't <laughs> but we're, we're gonna make you come back sometime if you're ever in new york and we'll talk about lionel atwell's sex scandal and the hideous sun well, demon i don't have any i don't have any first-hand information about no that. that's okay <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk we didn't get to talk about shock theater or all this other cool and stuff do you I'll have do it next time do yeah. you have any other things you want to plug before we wrap up um, do I want to plug anything else? Um, you want to tell us about the Hollywood Horror Museum? Well, you know, a, a bunch of us uh, uh, who are in the genre have gotten together, including some of the, the offspring of uh, the stars. Um, and um, we, we it's a genre that doesn't really get a lot of respect. And um, since the passing of Forrest J. Ackerman, uh, who had a lot of stuff in his house uh and you know bob burns who was the current holder of uh, a bunch of props um i think there's a feeling that uh there needs to be some permanent uh place for this stuff to be exhibited and uh, i think uh, the people behind this idea want to take it on the road initially uh and get uh, some more publicity for it uh, and then apparently ensconce it as part of either the uh, the current academy uh, plans for a museum, or maybe something on its own. Uh, I think all that's kind of up in the air, but uh, it's definitely something that's in the air, and I think worth um, uh, worth the effort because you know uh, this stuff doesn't last forever. Yeah, it's important to do it. I mean, we're we're doing this show, you know, in our small way to try to make people aware of and of, and of Bert Gordon and Janet Ann Gallo. One thing you said, and it's funny because I've experienced it, is people going, I, I had no idea who you were interviewing. I had no idea who you were talking about, but I've been looking up all the names now and, mm-hmm. and looking up these films. Well, that's 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 sort of what the whole thing's about. I mean, yeah, we're trying. Look, I mean, you know, we who are we except our past? I mean, it, our past has made us who we are. And and uh, there's so many people I think who uh, I meet who become interested in things that they didn't know existed. Well, uh, it's it's fun when you, we get a, you know the of course you know the actor James Karen. Sure. And we got James is an old friend of Gilbert's, and we talked to him, and we just got mail from people saying, "I knew the face, I didn't know his name." I, I'm so thankful to you guys for introducing me. It makes us feel good too to, exactly. to introduce and, and, these people and, and to. The important an, thing is to appreciate these people while they're still with us. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And it's funny because I remember when they used to have shows like Fantasy Island and Murder She Wrote, Love Boat. Love Boat, yeah. And, they, and you'd see these people who you thought were dead popping up, and you go, wow, they're as good as they ever were. Mm-hmm. But they're forgotten about. That's true. 
It's true. And then, but you know, the, uh, the one silver lining might be that there's so much stuff being made now. And so many TV shows, maybe too many, some people, some have said that there may be more opportunities for people to be able to be employed than, than there were. Well, okay. I'm gonna, uh, start wrapping up now. Let this man get on with his life. Yes. But there is so many more things we could talk about with you, Joe. It was fun. Okay. Well, just invite me back. We will. I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Thank you, Joe Dante. Thank you, Joe. We're going to send you a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Thank Joe. Thank you. Bye.